an obscure novelist morphing into a menacing killer. But what's truly unfathomable is that he had the audacity to write and publish a novel and delve into the chilling details of his own heinous crime. In today's video, we plunge into the depths of a story filled with strange, captivating, and mysterious events. So make sure to watch it until the end. In the eastern regions of Poland during the early days of December 2001, a gripping incident unfolded along the banks of a river. Three seasoned fishermen find themselves in the midst of an unexpected discovery. As they cast their gaze upon the water, a peculiar sight caught their attention. Beginning to be mistaken for a mere log or fragment of wood, their curiosity grew as they drew closer. It was then that the glimmering strands of long human hair emerged from the object, shattering their assumptions. Astonishingly, what they had initially dismissed was, in fact, a lifeless body adrift on the water's surface. The three expert fishermen combined their efforts to pull the body out of the river because they felt a sense of urgency. They found that it was the body of a man in his 30s, and they promptly contacted the local authorities. When the police arrived and received a briefing on the situation, they saw a tightly wound rope holding the lifeless body in place. His hands were tied together behind his back, and the rope went up to his neck and was tightly wrapped around it. The intricate bindings restricting the victim's hands behind his back were designed with a chilling purpose. Any struggle or attempt to free himself would only tighten the noose around his neck. Unfortunately, the body immersed in the river effectively erased any trace of potential evidence. Hopes of uncovering fingerprints, DNA, or other vital clues were shattered it became apparent that the perpetrator's meticulous plan was to obliterate any remnants of their presence within the crime. Expert examinations and medical evaluations disclosed the haunting details of the victim's ordeal. The report exposed severe wounds and bruises marring his body, while his stomach and intestines bore the hollow emptiness of prolonged starvation and torment. Additionally, the presence of water in his lungs indicated a grim fate. He had been cast into the river while still gasping for breath. As previously mentioned, the tightly bound rope around his neck ensured that his struggles would only hasten his demise, slowly constricting his air supply. The police discerned that this heinous act was undeniably personal. The perpetrator harbored a profound and intense animosity towards the victim, driven to subject him to the most excruciating forms of torture before his final breath. After an exhaustive search in their missing persons database, the police finally uncovered the identity of the victim. Darius Janiszewski. Darius was a man in his 30s, a manager in an advertising company. He had vanished without a trace for nearly a month until his lifeless body was discovered in the river. The investigators wasted no time and initiated thorough inquiries, conducting interviews with Darius's family, friends, and acquaintances. Regrettably, all their efforts yielded no results. According to those who knew him, Darius was an ordinary person living an uneventful, peaceful existence. He had no known problems, enemies, criminal background, or dubious connections. Frustratingly, each lead pursued by the police seemed to hit a dead end, leaving them perplexed. This frustrating stalemate persisted for six long months until they reluctantly acknowledged their inability to solve the case. Consequently, it was consigned to the archive of unsolved cases. Though officially closed, no active investigation was pursued, resulting in no progress. However, the Polish police adhered to a routine practice of periodically revisiting unresolved or dormant cases. This review didn't entail reopening the case or reinitiating the investigation. Rather, it involved assigning a fresh investigator to meticulously calm through the case files, scrutinizing if any pertinent details were overlooked by the original team and offering potential breakthroughs. Two years after the crime occurred, the case landed on the desk of a determined investigator named Jacek Robluski. He immersed himself in the case files painstakingly searching for clues buried within the documents. And during this thorough investigation, he discovered testimony from the victim's mother, which was an important piece of information that the initial investigators appeared to have missed. The mother, 
herself employed as an accountant in the advertising company owned and managed by her son, said that she received a call from an unidentified caller on November 13, 2000, the fateful day when Darius was last seen before vanishing. According to her account, at half past nine that morning, the office received a call from an unfamiliar voice inquiring about Darius. This person claimed to have an urgent project involving the printing of three large advertising posters. When Darius's mother probed for more information, the caller evaded her questions and insisted on speaking directly with Darius regarding the project. Although she found the caller's request peculiar and his evasiveness suspicious, she didn't dwell on it, casually and without much thought. She disclosed her son's mobile phone number so that the caller could contact him directly. Once the mysterious caller had obtained her son's number, the call abruptly ended, leaving his identity undisclosed. Several hours later, Darius returned to the office, and his mother informed him about the inquiry. Confirming the interaction, he revealed that he had spoken with the caller and agreed to meet him in the afternoon. This was the last conversation that took place between Darius and his mother before he completely disappeared. When the investigators traced these calls to the company office and Darius's mobile phone, they discovered that the call was made from a public phone. This phone was located on the same street where the advertising company building was situated. It means that this unknown person who made the calls was very close to the office and was likely observing the place. But the investigators immediately considered the caller a major suspect in the case. However, since the public phone could be used by anyone, it wouldn't lead them to a specific person, so they considered it a dead end. Now let's go back to the investigator who was reviewing the case files. When he noticed these events, he paid attention to a small detail that the previous investigators had missed. According to these events, Darius had a mobile phone that was not found at the crime scene, in his car, in his office, or anywhere else. Most likely, he had the phone with him when he disappeared. Probably the previous investigators who worked on this case before had assumed that Darius's phone was lost in the river or that the killer got rid of it. However, the investigators speculated that it was possible for the killer to have taken the phone and kept it, which means that if he could track the phone, he might be able to track the killer. Driven by this lead, investigator Jacek embarked on the journey and serendipitously uncovered the phone's purchase invoice in the victim's office. Within the invoice, the investigator found the phone's unique number, enabling them to track its usage through telecommunications companies. And the strange thing is that they found that the phone was still in use, even though the crime had occurred over two years ago. With this thread, the investigator meticulously traced its path, eventually arriving at the current owner of the phone. Along its journey, the phone has passed through the hands of four people over the past two years. Jacek pursued these people until he ultimately reached the source. The first person to use the phone after the crime informed the investigator that they had acquired it from an online marketplace three days after the incident. This revelation strongly suggests that the person who posted the phone for sale on the website was likely the killer. The investigator accessed the website archive and discovered that the phone was listed for approximately $100. The seller had used the username ChrisB7. Delving into the user's profile, the investigator uncovered the account owner's true identity, Christian Bala. Swiftly, the police extracted pertinent details and verified this person's identity through their database. Further investigation revealed that Christian was a man in his 30s, as well as an author of stories and novels. Investigator Jacek felt a surge of excitement as a solid suspect finally emerged in the case. Delving deep into Christian's life, Jacek decided to read his latest novel, a crime thriller titled Hamak. As the investigator delved into the pages, an eerie sensation washed over him. He felt as though he were perusing the memoirs of a killer. The brutal and sadistic narrative style employed by Christian to depict the crimes and murders triggered suspicion as if he were recounting genuine events that he had experienced and committed himself. In the depths of the novel, the protagonist bore the name Chris, a character who transcended human and natural boundaries, embodying a superhuman figure. 
Within its pages, the ninth chapter unravels the tragic demise of a young woman named Mary. In the novel's twisted narrative, Mary was Chris's lover, but her betrayal ignited a sinister chain of events. Chris ensnared her, binding her hands tightly with ropes and securing the same rope around her delicate neck, mirroring the haunting manner in which Darius had been restrained. The pages chronicled Chris's cruel torment of his treacherous companion, relentlessly subjecting her to unspeakable torture until her life ebbed away. Finally, Chris disposed of the murder weapon and other damning evidence by surreptitiously selling them on an online marketplace for used items. As the investigator delved into the novel's chilling details, an uncanny resemblance emerged between the fictional account and the undisclosed aspects of Darius's murder. The manner in which Darius had been bound, the connection of the rope from his hands to his neck, it all struck a disquieting chord within investigator Jacek. An unsettling realization began to take hold. Christian Bala, the author of the novel, seemed to bear an unsettling resemblance to the killer they sought. The police tried to bring Christian for questioning, but they quickly discovered he had fled Poland immediately after the crime in 2001. Without sufficient evidence to launch an investigation or initiate an international pursuit, the detectives were caught in a maze of hints that didn't prove anything with no clear direction toward discovering what drove the horrible crime. The officers' inquiries and research turned up no evidence of a relationship between the victim and Christian. After examining the torture marks on Darius's corpse and the crime scene, the police were sure that this was a very personal act motivated by the killer's deep-seated animosity. But why would Christian hold such animosity towards Darius, a man with whom he seemingly had no knowledge or interaction? Fearing that questioning Christian's relatives or acquaintances might inadvertently tip him off not to enter Poland, Jacek chose a different path. Returning to the novel that seemed to mirror reality, he clung to the hope of uncovering a motive that would reveal the enigma behind Christian's actions. Weeks turned into months, and months into years. Finally, in 2005, the security system at a Polish airport flagged a passport revealing its owner as a wanted individual. This person was Christian Bala. Swiftly detained by airport security, Christian was taken into custody and officially arrested by the waiting police. Five years after Darius's murder, the moment arrived for Jacek and his team to begin the interrogation. Christian Bala exuded an eerie calmness. His responses were measured, intelligent, and devoid of any leads. Desperation crept into the investigators' hearts, realizing that their words were falling on deaf ears. Amid their frustration, one investigator posed a seemingly innocuous question. Did you commit the crime alone, or were you assisting someone else? The investigator did not expect anything other than denial from Christian. However, it seemed that this seemingly provocative and trivial question triggered something in Christian's narcissistic spirit. He felt belittled or considered merely an accomplice. At that moment, Christian fell into silence and then calmly said, no, I didn't assist anyone. I committed the entire crime from start to finish by myself. The investigators were shocked by his response. They hadn't anticipated that such a seemingly provocative question would provoke him to this extent. Suddenly, Christian's demeanor shifted, his gaze darting anxiously around the room. His face contorted with a mix of shock and terror, and he clutched his clothes, his body writhing as if suffocating in the grip of a relentless nightmare. And so it began, with him unleashing screams upon the investigators, demanding that they bring a doctor. The investigation came to an abrupt halt as they urgently summoned an ambulance. A few minutes later, the ambulance arrived, accompanied by a doctor who delicately placed Christian on the stretcher and began examining him. After finishing the examination, the doctor told the investigators that the tests had yielded no abnormalities and that there was no reason to prevent them from continuing the investigation. The investigators returned with Christian to the interrogation room. Christian returned to his calm demeanor and sat silently in his place. Then the investigators brought papers to Christian with statements and asked him to sign them. But suddenly, Christian changed his story 
retracted his words, and said that the written confessions on the papers were wrong. He once again denied committing the crime. The investigators realized that this man had been playing with them. They knew they were dealing with a mentally ill person with a highly narcissistic personality. They knew that they had no choice but to build a strong case against him in court. So Jacek began investigating and questioning people close to Christian. He started questioning his family and friends. Through these investigations, Jacek started to learn more about Christian's personality and his past. He knew that Christian was known for his intelligence and strong personality, but he was also known to be narcissistic, a liar, and a manipulator who told legendary stories about himself. Paradoxically, despite his astuteness, Christian's endeavors in various fields ended in failure. He ventured into business and corporate realms, but he failed every time. During his research, Jacek found out that Christian had been married and separated almost a year before the crime. His ex-wife hit her breaking point and filed for divorce to get away from the sad life with him. However, Christian felt that this divorce was a stab to his pride, and he became obsessed with his ex-wife even more than when she was his wife. His narcissism made him see her as his property, and she had no right to act on her own or be with another person. So this crazy narcissist started to pursue his ex-wife, tracking her every move. Sometimes he would intercept her and threaten her with death, warning her that he would kill any other man who would approach her or try to start a relationship with her. In that year, in the year 2000, Sasha met a new man who entered her life, and this man was Darius. Here the picture became clear to the investigators, and they understood that the motive behind this crime was jealousy, the same motive present in the novel. The difference is that Chris in the novel killed his unfaithful lover, while in real life he killed his ex-wife's lover. This is how Jacek understood why the killer harbored resentment towards Darius. As we mentioned earlier, before his death, Darius was tortured and starved for several days. Then he was thrown into the river while still alive, after being bound with ropes. After Christian's arrest, the case became a magnet for press and media attention. It garnered international coverage, capturing the interest of European and even American media. The craziest thing was the skyrocketing success of Christian's novel, which quickly became a bestseller in Poland and across Europe. However, a shockwave reverberated through the courtroom when the decision was made to exclude the novel as evidence in Christian's trial. The prosecutor said that a novel is a work of fiction and could not serve as proof of the charges against Christian. Mere similarities between the novel and Darius's murder did not equate to confessions from Christian. Ironically, Christian himself desired the court to utilize his novel against him. He went so far as to attempt to introduce it as evidence in the courtroom, contending that it should be used against him. Yet the judge promptly dismissed his request, clarifying that the trial's focus was on his crime, not his literary creation. This revelation left him seething with fury as his primary defense strategy crumbled before his eyes. Evidently, the mounting tension had taken its toll on him since the early stages of the trial. His calm and confident demeanor vanished in a moment when he learned that the charges were becoming more and more substantiated against him without him having any ability to defend himself. Firstly, there was Darius's phone, which was one of the stupidest things he did. Instead of throwing away or getting rid of the phone, he sold it online. The second piece of evidence was the public phone card that Christian used. He made the first anonymous call to the publicity office when Darius's mother answered, and later the same unknown person called Darius's personal phone number from the same public phone. All these calls were made using the same card, and this card belonged to Christian. The third piece of evidence was the testimony of his ex-wife, Sasha, who described the violent treatment she received from him, his obsession with her even after their divorce, and his explicit threats that he would kill any man who entered her life. She clearly explained to the court that she had a relationship with Darius before his disappearance and the revelation of his murder. However, Christian continued to deny her statements and repeated during the trial that he didn't know Darius and had no contact with him, and therefore he had no motive to kill him. 
The fourth piece of evidence was the items found by the police after searching his mother's house. Christian was living in his mother's house before leaving Poland, so the police decided to search the house for any traces he might have left behind. However, when they searched the house, they found a collection of items that Christian left behind. Among these items was a note with details about Darius's company. During the trial, Christian insisted that she didn't know Darius, had no contact with him, and hadn't even heard his name before. But the existence of this note among his belongings shattered his claims and exposed his blatant lie in front of the court. The fifth evidence consisted of comments written by Christian on the internet about a popular crime program that aired on Polish television. This program covered the case from its inception in 2001, and a presenter even attempted to assist the police by publicizing the case to the general public. The program had an online platform where they consistently received comments about the crime throughout the years. It was later revealed, after investigation, that Christian was the one writing these comments on the program's website. After all the evidence presented in court, it was more than sufficient. The sheer quantity of this circumstantial evidence played a decisive role in the case. Indeed, the court and the judge ruled him guilty of the crime and the murderer but the verdict they announced was rather peculiar. Despite having committed this heinous crime, tortured his victim, and even wrote a novel proudly showcasing his crime, he only got a 25-year sentence, which means that he will be released in 2032 when he is around 60 years old. After his release, immense profits are waiting for him in the bank from the sales of his novel, which became famous because of his crime. Nevertheless, he still denies committing this crime and claims that the court and the police used a fictional novel to fabricate the charges against him. Here we come to the end of the story. What is your opinion on this crime? Do you think the verdict was fair? Write your thoughts in the comments. I hope you enjoyed the story. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Also, click the bell icon to receive notifications of the new videos.